once again, it's your host, Gabe Morales, here. We have a very special guest today. We have Mr. Jim Fuda. He is with Crime Stoppers of Puget Sound. So for you people who are not from the Puget Sound area, basically that's everything from Seattle North up to the Canadian border. How are you doing today, sir? Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, great. We're glad to have you. Can you tell us, Jim, where were you born and raised? Well, I'm a first-generation Italian here from overseas. My parents migrated here to Seattle and uh, was born in the old Rainier Valley area, the Garlic Gulch area where they used to call it in the 50s. So I'm born and raised in Seattle. Can you tell us a little bit about then where did you go to high school and what did you do after high school? Yeah, I grew up with a Catholic education uh, through grade school, and I went to O'Day High School here, Irish, run by the Irish Christian Brothers. And then I was in college, and a couple of things happened. My draft number was really low, and I ended up getting drafted. And while I was home on leave with orders for Vietnam, Nixon did away with draftees having to go to a combat zone. So I finagled myself back to Fort Lewis here in Seattle, and I was still underage. I, they made me a military policeman because that's what I was studying. And then so I was able to take the test for the King County Sheriff's Office underage. So I turned 21, got discharged from the military and hired by the Sheriff's Department in a 10 day period. So I'm still the youngest one they've ever taken on as a sworn deputy. I know you started military police there in the military, but what made you even get interested in doing law enforcement? I had some friends that worked for the Seattle Police Department, a couple of guys that were great mentors, a few years older than me. They were just instrumental in helping me decide what I really wanted to do for a calling. And I really look at law enforcement and police work as a calling, not just a job. Uh, I always felt, I, I'm now 70 years old. I started as a military policeman at 19. So I've been in this over five decades and I still don't feel like I've worked a day in my life. I mean, because it was a calling and something that I really wanted to do. You had a passion for. Yeah. Exactly. All right. No, I, I know the feeling. It definitely isn't for everybody, but you know, for the People interested in it, check it out. You can always do ride-alongs, you know, talk to your Jim did, uh, and like I did in younger days, talk to, you know, your a cop that you trust, that you you respect, and ask them about the job, you know, and check it out and see if it's for you. So you work with King County. What kind of assignments did you have there, and did you work with any other agencies? Work strictly with King County as my law enforcement career, and I was a beat cop at the Burien Precinct at that was the era of the Green River Killer. You know, Gary Ridgeway did all those. That was my patrol district. Then I got promoted, worked at the Federal Way Precinct when that was King County then, uh, before they incorporated. And then I was had my year in with my probation and an opening came up in special operations. Well, I ran the hostage negotiations team and I was part of that team for 25 of my 33 years. So they put me back in, in special ops. So I always joke it was the big boys with the toys. So, you know, that although negotiations was an ancillary assignment, my main line, I ran a traffic unit for a while. I ran the Marine unit for a while. I ran canine for a while. And I mean, it was just all, you know, exciting, fun, first responder stuff. Great, great. So I know hostage negotiations is a very special skill set. You have to have not only tactical knowledge, but good communication skills. So I imagine that transferred over to a lot of other things for you. Absolutely. And, you know, it was one of those things where it was really a challenge because, you know, cops are type A personalities. They want to go in and they want to take care of the problem. But to sit back and wait and have discussion to solve things peacefully was difficult for for many officers. And I remember when we first started our teams, I was one of the first members of our team that we formed in 82. And we had trouble, as did many departments around the United States, when hostage negotiation teams started to come around and to work together with the SWAT teams because the SWAT team's initial role changed to the containment aspect of it. Get, you know, recon intelligence however they could, but just to hold the perimeter for a while and make their plans if they had to make a quick entry while the negotiators were doing what we do. Right. De-escalation, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, two kind of almost two extremes of that realm of work, hostage negotiations. So can you tell us why did you get with Crime Stoppers of Puget Sound? Well, that evolved later after WTO here where we had the, our riots and demonstrations and things. I was tasked by the feds just because I was one of the planners to write a demonstration course for Indonesia. 
And while I was still working as a sergeant with the sheriff's office, I went back a couple of times after writing that course and did some iterations of that training. So my name was already set with the feds. So I retired in 2006. I retired March 17th. I did St. Patrick's Day. So I wouldn't forget it when I was an old guy. And five days later, I was on a plane to Pakistan. So I worked in and out of Pakistan for two years. Most time I was there like three weeks to eight weeks and then back home. And then another assignment, you go back and forth. So I was all over that country. Then came home and worked for Microsoft as their global event security director for a year. And I just didn't feel like I fit very well with the private sector. So I went back to the feds and then landed a role as the senior executive advisor to the Minister of Interior in Bosnia, the Serb part of Bosnia, which is called the Republic of Srpska. So I went and did that. And the reason I came home after 14 months is, you know, I'm the oldest in, in like a lot of cultural families. I'm the oldest in an Italian family. My mom dies. So I came back you know, to help take care of uh, dad and, and did that. And a friend of mine, Merle Carter, with the Seattle Police Department, who started the Crime Stoppers program, says, Jim, why don't you come on over? I'm thinking of stepping down a bit and, you know, take over. We kind of co-direct for a while. And we did that for like three years. He finally retired and I have it all. So what happened in November of 2017, we started using an anonymous tip app and our tips quadrupled overnight, which means our arrests more than doubled. And what we learned is we're in the gaming generation. And I joke, I can't get my 17 year old granddaughter to talk to me on the telephone, but she texts me back in 30 seconds. So thinking of the success of this app, I decided how can this be utilized in developing countries where corruption is the base of these, why they're allowed to continue and the crimes that have no borders. So I had trusted policemen already in Serbia. And Crime Stoppers is a partnership between the police, the public, and the media. So we go to the media and put out stories so the citizens who know might some information but are afraid to talk about it can give the information anonymously. So we went back and I did one press release and one presentation to four countries, and I had 47 tips in a week. So we knew the concept would work. It's just that we learned two things. A local program can't sustain it. And that two is that Bosnia was not the place to start. Bosniaks, Muslim, Croats, Catholics, Serbs, Orthodox. If one likes it, the other two don't. So he moved it to Serbia, which is kind of the leader country in, in Eastern Europe anyway. And it took two years to build trusted relationships to where we actually had trusted Serbian upper echelon commanders here in Seattle, February 2020, to learn about the operational side of how everything works. Three weeks later, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So last year we went back, those people have disappeared. We've been back three times since to get things established. But one of the other points is that in that time, Moldova got a hold of me because of the Ukrainian war. Chisinau, their, their main city, is 30 miles from the Ukrainian border. They are being influxed by refugees, which brings a whole new level of corruption. And so they're, they're interested as well. So we're moving it forward in, in that direction as well. Got you. So yeah, I understand then out of your experiences there in Eastern Europe that you decided to start a new project, correct? Correct. And so those crimes with transnational crimes that are new group started Crime Stoppers Global Solutions with some think tank people from around the globe. We pick human trafficking, terrorism, illicit trade, arms dealing, drug smuggling, cybercrime, and bank fraud, all corruption based. But obviously, what's the key here now? We're going to talk human trafficking. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that is dear to my heart and that needs to be stopped. But they're somehow all interconnected. You know, on the Balkan route, a lot of that starts in South Asia, through the Middle East, through Turkey, and in through the Balkan route. And once they cross a corrupt border, they're free to run all of Western Europe, and which makes it easier to come to the States and or even cause all these problems in Western Europe. So the idea was is to hit it at the source or the transit routes. So that's the concept we're moving forward with. Got you. That sounds very interesting. Tell us, Jim, what are some of the things that we can help do to stop human trafficking? Well, the idea behind it is that human trafficking is a crime that's hidden in plain sight. 
especially in our country. You, and I, I always ask people when I give presentations, how many of you get pedicures? And of course, the hands go up. And I said, well, tell me and pay attention next time. Is the girl working on your feet? Is it the same girl every time? And does that girl talk to you or does she just talk to the to the store owner in the native language and the store owner talks to you? If that's the case and it's a different person, you're most like looking at a, a form of human trafficking where somebody's controlling their credentials and their movements. Uh, and sometimes their families are being threatened or, or they're sent here by a trafficker and that debt to the traffickers will never get paid off. So they're in they're in their debt. I got a call three weeks ago from the South Sudan of all places, a human rights organization, and they were in tears that Americans would even talk to them. They have a, a civil war going on. Warlords are killing the men, putting women and girls in sex camps and young boys as young as four into work camps. So these are the kind of some atrocities that are going on that none of us could even get a concept around that that's what's happening. What I'm talking about what citizens can do is pay attention and report some of the, these things that, that's going on. I mean, here in Bellevue, during the pandemic, they rolled up a, a double garage door and found 30 Asians making knockoff Gucci's that were there, obviously, against their will. So these are the kinds of things that are happening. It's not just the sex trade, although that's the highest part of it. But And even internet crimes against children is up 43% because of what the pandemic had. And guys are pretending that they are 16-year-olds and a, they get a 14-year-old girl to talk to them and the girl spills her guts out to him about family and this problem and that problem. And then the guy grooms them enough to get a semi or nude photo. Once that guy has that photo, is that poor thing is done. They're threatened. How would you like your principal to see this? So they expect it more explicit, explicit pictures. And those are the ones that go to the dark web. This is how some of these kids are being exploited. And because of that, teen suicide rates are up. And they're so hard to capture because, I'll give you an example. When I lived in Bosnia, I wanted to stream some American TV. I couldn't do it with a Bosnian IP address, but I could buy an American one for $7 for a year. I, this girl thinks she's talking to a 16-year-old. It could be a 37-year-old who knows what from any part of the world because he's got a U.S. IP address. But to follow that trap, that trade, and 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 to get enough cops and detectives that are able to learn and learn how to work that. Plus, the Internet is changing so fast is that our laws aren't even uh, keeping up. So there is a group out there called Internet Crimes Against Children. They are in 61 major cities. Seattle Police hosts one of them, but it, it brings together prosecutors and cops and other investigators to try to put some kind of dent in this prolific crime. Thank you for that. And so we have a public education announcement here that we're going to play for you. It tells you a little bit more about what Jim and others are doing in regards to this topic. Every minute of every day, two children are being prepared for sexual exploitation. The average age of these children is 14, but many are as young as three. Child sexual exploitation is a 14 to $16 billion a year business. The top three countries involved in these horrific acts are India, Brazil, and sadly, the United States. I recently heard of a case where two 16-year-old girls were rescued after being in captivity since they were both 14 and had been raped multiple times a day until they were rescued just last month. As if this wasn't horrific enough, there was a third girl that was not so fortunate. She was taken by her captors transported to an Eastern European country where her organs were harvested for resale to the highest bidder on the black market. This occurs on a regular basis and is simply cold-blooded, premeditated murder and needs to be stopped. Crime Stoppers Global Solutions has developed state-of-the-art app technology where citizens can report crimes anywhere in the world anonymously without fear of retribution for criminals. Once an anonymous citizen has submitted a tip utilizing the secure app, 
That information will immediately be sent to trusted law enforcement detectives for investigation. This simple process gives a voice to citizens, allows them to submit valuable criminal information, and enables all of us to do our part to stop child sex trafficking. Here's how your tax-deductible donation helps in this vital cause. Supports the necessary technology that aids in gathering crucial intelligence on traffickers anywhere in the world. Supports local Crime Stopper Global Solutions programs in developing countries. Creates a reward fund to pay tipsters for key information that leads to an arrest and charges of child sex traffickers. Please give your tax deductible donation today. You can give a one-time donation or register to give on a monthly basis. You can give a hundred, fifty, 25 or even $5 a month. Every dime of what you pledge will go directly towards saving a child from a life of physical and sexual abuse and possibly murder. Together, we can help stop these types of violent crimes against innocent children. Together, we can make a difference. Remember, every minute of every day, two children are being prepared for sexual exploitation. You know what you would do if this was your child. Please, please help us to do the same for those children who have no voice. For more information, go to www.thecsgs.org. Once again, www.thecsgs.org. I'm Jim Futa, founder and vice chairman of Crime Stoppers Global Solutions. Thank you. Jim, once again, thank you for coming on the show. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we go? Well, I am just so thankful that people like you are putting on podcasts like this that allows words and these things to, to come out. So I, I truly appreciate it. You're very welcome. Next time I'm in Seattle, maybe we can grab a cup of coffee. I'd like to see it. Absolutely. My treat for sure. All right. Take care, Jim. Sure.